look, here's the deal. To answer that question, let me just share with you, there's nothing more exciting than standing on a stage at Tony Robbins Business Mastery next to David Merriman Scott, my dear friend, in front of 2,000 screaming, motivated, bright individuals that want to hear your message, right? And I remember having done this a couple of years in a row, looking over at David and thinking to myself, Peter, how did this happen? Right? How did this happen? How did that kid growing up on a ranch in Tucson, Arizona, somehow with an average, uh, let's just say, participation in our educational system, I wasn't that motivated. I enjoyed sports and girls and motocross and extracurricular activities more so than hitting the books. You know, that followed me into squeezing a four-year degree into a five-year experience at the University of Arizona, which a lot of law schools aren't really looking at. If you're supposed to graduate in four years, graduate in four years, right? But I changed majors, full, full disclosure. I was an engineering major, and then I switched over to the business school. Back when I was in college, Peter, it was very inexpensive. My folks were like, take your time, just get a degree, Right. My roommate told me when I graduated, Peter, I was the first roommate he had ever had that graduated from the University of Arizona, and he graduated in nine years, okay? He wasn't a doctor. It was a bachelor's degree. He was the original Van Wilder of the University of Arizona. Wonderful human being. Everybody loved this guy. But the point is, is it was an interesting journey to go from there to law school and end up on stage at Tony Robbins. And I was one of those individuals that just enjoyed life. I had, you know, a jack of all trades and a master of none. Grew up on the tennis courts in Tucson. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of people can relate to that. And that's why I'm so proud about it. Just look, growing up on the tennis courts in Tucson, Arizona, you know, on the ranch, you know, riding horses, shoveling horse shit. When I had to go out and do the lawn or or work in the backyard we're talking acres and acres and acres it wasn't just your typical lawn next to the front street a lot of a lot of good hard work at the growing up for my mom and dad um and uh and then playing all the different sports that we all know of you know one of the things for me peter was senior year in football 115 degrees in tucson arizona full pads i'm looking up at a mountain which was the 600 foot mountain next to our high school watching hang gliders fly off the top. And I'm thinking to myself, I need to be up there in the cool desert evening breeze and then down here on this hot football field, <clears throat> unappreciated, not playing, getting enough playing time, you know, life's too short, right? And I remember my buddy and I signing up for hang gliding lessons, uh, enjoying the sport. A year later, we both had our expert hang for pilot's licenses and we flew all around Arizona and California. And I just remember that was the first time in my life where I, I, I figured out that it's, it, if you really want to do something, there's a process. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. For me to become a hang glider pilot, it meant going to ground school. It meant starting off on flat ground. It meant going down to Snoida, Arizona and running down a very gentle hill until all of a sudden one of your steps results in your feet not touching the ground. And you're literally gliding six to 12 inches of ground you know, above the ground on a slight slope. From there, going to uh, Merriam Crater, just outside of Flagstaff, Arizona, and flying off a 1,500-foot, you know, extinct volcano crater and having an hour-long flight. You know, there's a process to it. So I was that, that, that cowboy from Tucson that had this interesting journey that I've just shared with you after graduating, moving to Lake Tahoe, helping open up Caesars Tahoe, being a ski bum in the winter, racing and sailing windsurfers and sailboards in the summer for a couple of years, met a lawyer at Heavenly Valley that I skied with. He said, Mitch, if you want to go to law school, do it now before you have too many obligations, financial, personal, otherwise. And so that's what I did. Came back into Tucson, studied my ass off for the, uh, the LSAT, which is a test that you take to see if you can get into law school. I did pretty well on the LSAT, which surprised a lot of people. Got into a couple of different law schools, picked one here in Southern California, uh, met my beautiful wife, my last year of law school, and the rest is history. So all of that has helped me, I think, connect with people in the courtroom. When I look over at a jury, uh, when I'm 
trying to build rapport, when I'm trying to connect, when I'm trying to tell my client's story, it's not what I learned in law school. It's not what I've learned in the courtroom. It's, it's that life story that you bring and that I bring to the table, whether we're consulting, whether we're practicing law, whether we're creating content on social media, all of these things, you know, I, I just like to tap into and build upon because I think we can share our experiences to add value to the jury, to the judge, to uh, the laws in our community and on social media, to the messages that we're, that we're sharing with our audiences. So that's actually the short answer to a very good question. I appreciate it, Peter.